I said that today we look at a few more examples of the ratio test, and then we look briefly at another test called the root test. And I guess what I've main, mainly want to do, I mean, we've done so many um, examples already, but in all of the examples, the limit ended up being either zero or infinity, and or one. We looked at an example where the ratio test fails, and the limit doesn't have to be one, zero, or infinity. So I thought, we should look at an example where the limit is something else. Um, I apologize in advance for the sort of extreme messiness of this example, but the limit tends to be, you know, something other than zero, one, and infinity when you've just got the same kind of function in the numerator and the denominator. Um, in previous examples, we were mixing factorials and exponentials, and that's what caused the limits to be so extreme. So we probably don't have a huge amount of intuition about whether this converges or diverges. I mean, I guess I might say, well, the, the 10 on the top is bigger than the four down below, but, but this isn't a geometric series. There's also that n plus one. So I don't know what this is going to do, but fortunately, one of the one of the strengths of the um, ratio test is that you don't need to have any intuition. You can just plug and play with it. Um, to me, this is an obvious candidate for the ratio test. And I guess saying that might not be very helpful to you. But when I think the ratio test, I think factorials, which we don't have. But then I think exponents, which we do have. I think division and multiplication, but not addition. I would be a lot less confident in the ratio test if our denominator looked like that for example, but with exponents and multiplication, I think the ratio test has an excellent chance of working here. And the ratio test always produces these these profoundly messy looking expressions. Um, we get fractions of fractions. Maybe I'll do this. So in the top, everywhere N appears, We replace it with n plus one. Sorry for the, the kind of tiny handwriting. Um, it, in that sum, n plus one plus one is n plus two. So I'm just doing a tiny bit of um, simplification there. Then in the denominator, negative 10 to the n, 4, 
to the 2n plus 1, n plus 1. And now, um, again, never say always in calculus too, but 99% of the time you use the ratio test, you get this fraction of fractions, and then you multiply by the denominator by the reciprocal of the denominator to get a single fraction. So Let's see if we can do this. We'll have negative 10 to the n plus 1, 4 to the 2n plus 1, and n plus 1 up in the numerator. And then we'll have negative 10 to the n, and we'll have a 4, and let me just simplify this now. 2n plus 2 plus 1, 2n plus 3, n plus 2. And again, sort of the form of the ratio test leaves you with these common terms, let's say, in the top and the bottom. We've got powers of 10 over powers of 10. We've got negative 10. We've got powers of 4 over powers of 4. We've got n's over n. And we're going to look at these sort of as their own individual pieces. So because we just have multiplication and division, uh, What's happening? Here we go. Because we just have multiplication and division, the absolute value is going to be easy to work with. The absolute value of a product is the product of the absolute values. The absolute value of a quotient is the quotient of the absolute values. If instead of having this multiplication, I mentioned that I would be a lot less confident about the ratio test if we had addition here. That's because we get to this step and we'd have the absolute value of a sum and it would be really hard to do anything with. But for this product, I mean, the end result of this absolute value is that these um, negative tens are going to turn to positive ten? Um, you know, just very briefly, the absolute value of a negative number raised to a power. Well. That's the absolute value of a product. And again, the way the absolute value works, we take the absolute value of all the terms in the product and they all become positive. So those negative tens are going to become positive tens. And that's the only thing the absolute value is going to do. Um, so 10 to the n plus 1 over 10 to the n 
4 to the 2n plus 1. over 4 to the 2n plus 3 and n plus 1 over n plus 2. And let's um, see what happens. And what's going to happen is that we're, well, why try to summarize when we can dive right in? Remember, at this point, we're not taking a limit. We're just doing simplification. That if we've got the same power or the same base, I mean, in the top and the bottom, we can subtract. And we get 10. In this case, 4 to the 2n plus 1 minus 2n plus 3. The 2n's go away. The 2n's cancel. We get 4 to the negative 2. And now that n plus 1 over n plus 2, things don't simply cancel in the way they did for the other terms. But when we take a limit, it will turn to 1. Let me go through that. The limit as n goes to infinity. We've got a 10. We've got a 1 over 16. And we've got an n plus 1 over an n plus 2. And I feel like we've done a lot of examples that look basically like this, now that we've introduced the, um, the ratio test. This is infinity over infinity. And that is going to 1. So this is going to 10 over 16. 10 over 16 is less than 1, meaning that this converges. Um, the intuition I suggested at the beginning of the problem I said I didn't know if it would converge or diverge, but that 10 is bigger than the 4, so maybe it looks a little like a divergent geometric series. That intuition was wrong. And again, the, the great power of this method is that you don't need any intuition as long as you can take the limits and as long as the limits aren't one you just run the ratio test and you get whatever answer you get <laughs> so I'll talk about the root test and I'll talk about the root test kind of briefly, because the root test is a lot more limited than the ratio test. Um, it's, it's so limited, in fact, that rather than getting its own section, it's unceremoniously bundled in at the end of the ratio test chapter. And the root test, looks a lot like the ratio test in sort of its general form. You take a limit of an absolute value and you ask, is it less than one or is it 
crater than one. Um, so once again, we're looking at a series. Once again, we're trying to determine its convergence or divergence. The root test says we can take the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root of the absolute value of a sub n. Um, and if this is less than one, the series converges, it's greater than one, the series diverges, and if it's equal to one, the test fails. So it looks a lot like the ratio test in this sense. But I've said it's not, I mean, maybe it's a mistake to sort of uh, talk down material if you want students to learn it. But I have said that I think it's less useful than the ratio test. And that's because on a purely concrete, actually doing the problem level, we don't really have any way of finding the nth the limit of the nth root of a to the n most of the time. Um, to use the root test and to use the ratio test, we have to find limits in the examples we have done, um, the limit with the ratio test, the limits have not been tricky. Here, the limits, I mean, it's all kind of inscrutable. Like, let's say something whose convergence we know. We've done this example. It was our very first example with the ratio test. This thing converges. What about the root test? Well, The nth on the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root of one over n factorial. Which the root of a quotient is the quotient of the roots. So we want, sorry, so we wind up with this. And if you have any intuition about this limit, you're, you're ahead of me. I mean, it's the 5,000th root of 5,000 factorial, a big or a small number. What's this doing? Um, and, and the issue here is that um, the root and the factorial are fighting each other. The factorial is getting big as n increases, but the root is making things small as n increases. So we probably don't have a lot of intuition about this limit. And... 
Now, if we can't take the limit, then we're tripping on the starting line because taking the limit is nine tenths of these problems. Um, realistically, I think that the root test is useful in basically one situation, and that's the situation where you have a power that is mucking things up. I mean, imagine something like this. Um, with that power there, it's really hard to know how to proceed. Um, well, if we didn't have the power, this would be a classic limit comparison. You'd say, well, the top looks about like negative two to the n, and the bottom looks about like n cubed. And, you know, you might not immediately know what to do with the negative sign, but this is basically a P-series, it converges. So if you didn't have the power there, we'd be able to do that. But we do have the power. And this power, I mean, nothing we try here is really going to work. The ratio test is not going to work well because going back to something I was saying earlier, because we have that addition in the top and the bottom. You know, never say never, but usually that kind of addition makes the ratio test hard to work with. And I mean, you can, Concretely speaking, you can try the uh, the ratio test and see what will happen, but But I mean, what happens is that we get this and then we can't do anything with this because the bases are not the same. We could only subtract the powers, only subtract the n plus one and the n if the bases were the same, which they aren't. So this is a mess. I, I have no idea what this limit is or how you would take this limit. Integral test, uh, no, I, I have even less idea how you would integrate this thing. But I mean, now that we've seen the root test, one thing is kind of screaming out to us maybe, because if we use the root test, then that nth power is going to go away. The limit as n goes to infinity, the nth root of So again, uh, one one thing like fact 
Oreo was absolute values are sometimes kind of awkward in the sense that there's no class where you really sit down and master using absolute values. It's just something you do in bits and pieces. But the absolute value of a power is the power of the absolute value. And now we've got the nth root of an nth power. So the limit as n goes to infinity of this absolute value. Although the absolute value isn't uh, going to concretely be doing much here because um, we, can, we can move limits in the side absolute values and and this is this is zero um we can use lobital's rule if we can't you know just see this 1 minus 2n over n cubed plus 3 negative 2 over 3n squared, we plug infinity in. We get zero. So, I mean, you might at this sort of, at this point in your career, you might just be able to look at this limit and say, oh, this is zero and you know not write down all of the details of L'Hopital's rule that's perfectly fine um in any event zero is less than one so this thing converges. And again, I, I think sort of getting rid of um getting rid of those powers get it is is the main thing that the root test is really useful for. Oh, I guess with 20 minutes left, we'd better do a different example. Um, let's just let's try to find an example where where we don't get zero. We seem to be getting zero and infinity so often. We should shake things up a little. Um, let's say we have this. Um, again, we might sort of go into this with some kind of intuition, you know, that that looks sort of like five sevenths in the um inside the parentheses. So this looks kind of like a convergent geometric series. But again, that kind of intuition is hard to rely on. And although I've been sort of, you know, downplaying the root 
test, we shouldn't deny that in this way, it has the exact same advantages that the ratio test has, which is that you can just use it. And if you don't have any intuition, or if you have intuition, but your intuition is wrong, well, if you can find the limit, it doesn't matter. Um, if, you, if you can find the limit, the root test will give you an answer. Intuition or no intuition. Again, I'm using the fact that that our root of um, an absolute value raised to a power is the, I said that wrong, but I'm once again using the fact that powers come in and out of absolute, what the heck? Oh. Tornado drill test. Um, I think what I'm getting is that, well, both. Oh, oh. I didn't hear anything, but I, I thought it was at nine. I don't know why I got a text then. Anyway, sorry, I, I'm rambling. Um, I'm using the fact that we can take powers in and out of absolute values. And I'm using that because the nth root of an absolute value isn't anything, whereas the nth root of an nth power is. We need this for the root and the power to collectively go away. And um, again, this is a situation where if you don't see the limit, you can just hammer it with L'Hopital's rule. Maybe you see off the top of your head that this limit is five sevenths. Um, the, the limit as n goes to infinity of a function is the horizontal asymptote of the function. So it really comes down to whether or not you remember finding horizontal asymptotes from high school algebra or wherever you learn that. But whether you just see it or whether you use L'Hopital's rule, five sevenths is less than one. And this series converges. And although I'm, I'm loath uh, to let you go after only half an hour, um, if if we just trundled on, I don't I don't know what we talk about on Thursday. So um, enjoy your your twenty extra minutes, I guess, and. <laughs>